Hello, good evening and welcome. I'm John Gilhooley, Director of Wigmore Hall, and it's a great joy to greet online audiences from around the world for tonight's live broadcast. This evening, the Swiss pianist Francesco Piemontesi joins us for the first concert in his complete cycle of Schubert's Piano Works, which takes place at Wigmore Hall over the course of the next three seasons. Piemontesi is already best known to our audiences here for his outstanding Mozart interpretations heard a few seasons ago. However, now we have the pleasure of hearing him in Schubert, a most rewarding musical journey, and one that begins tonight with four impromptus, D899, written in 1827, the penultimate year of Schubert's life. After the interval, we will hear the composer's piano sonata in D, D850, written two years earlier in the summer of 1825. Do remember to stay tuned at the interval when you can hear an interview with Francesco in which he talks about his preparations for this series. The entire interview can be found online as a podcast. Please enjoy these striking pieces of music which demonstrate the infinite variety of Schubert's imagination and welcome to the stage Francesco Piemontesi.
this is the first pro, uh, program of uh, uh, six recital programs that I will do here at the Wigmore, um, which include the, the works of uh, Schubert from 1822 to 1828, so the last six years of his production, so the eight sonatas and impromptus and stuff like this. And then I will add in the middle also the list B minor sonata, which um, just to counterbalance a little bit. But I think so. This this concert is I, I can say it is the beginning of a Schubert cycle that I do here at Wigmore Hall. So I will not tour um, the whole thing in 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 most of my recitals. But there are certain places like the Schubert Yard in Austria and, and other concert halls where I will be presenting this cycle. Mm. And why have you chosen to start this cycle with that particular sonata? It's a big sonata, the one in D, isn't it? It's 40 minutes. I know some commentators think of it as a sort of like a sketch for a symphony. It's, it's a big virtuoso piece. Yes, I think it is. Uh, first of all, I think it's one of the, um, I, you know, within this 1822-28 period is, is one which is relatively at the beginning. So I will end the two, the, the three last concerts with nine five eight in the third last, nine five nine in the second last, and then nine sixteen in the in the last concert. So, and then it, of course it was a big challenge to find programs which um, are compelling in itself. You know, I don't want to to do any encyclopedic work. You know, every. Uh, Deutsch uh, Verzeichnis of Schubert, you know, a every piece which has been written there. I, I took a selection of these pieces and then presenting them here at the Wigmore Hall, which has been a musical home for me for the last 12 or 13 years, um, with the public that I know and the public who knows me. So I want to share, I think, the, the pieces within this time which mean the most to me. And also, I want to present them in a way which is compelling and makes sense. So I thought that this sonata, which is, as you say, it is a big work and virtuosistic and, and, and quite on a big scale, and then to counterbalance it with the first set of Amprontius, which I think is more um, light, if I could use this word, it's more optimistic. Um, and I think it works very, very well also um, uh, you know, to prepare then the mood for this this big second half. I think it works very, very well. Because I guess one, one big distinction between the sonata and those impromptus is that the sonata was, was written for a professional to play. The impromptus were written for the, the popular market, for amateurs. It could be, though I'm not so sure that with Schubert, this is always the case. I find that his piano works often are, and this includes the impromptus and the sonatas as well, are a kind of journal intime, you know, it's a, a personal diary. You know, Schubert had, an, I think, a very, very struggling life, also on a musical basis, because if he was fighting like, uh, like a lion to have success uh, with his operas and symphonies, and actually never achieved that kind of success that he wanted. And uh, believe it or not, having written uh, wonders like the, 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 the string quintet or, or some of the latest sonatas, one year before his death, he inscribes himself to, uh, for a counterpoint uh, lesson with, with Zechter. So can you imagine the damage that the society did to, him, uh, to this man? I mean, so he, I think that that he and was, yet. yeah, he was. Sorry, he was destroyed in in this in this uh, in this relationship. I think, and I think he finds a way to express himself through this journal and team, which are the piano works, and to play them in front of this group of of people, which is called the Schubert Yard. I think this is the 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 historical background we don't have to forget when we talk about these works. Right. But in, in 1825, when he wrote the, the, the D major sonata, I mean, that, that was a time when things were looking good for him, wasn't it? I mean, the, he, 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 he had, there's a confidence about Schubert at that moment in time. I know he's frustrated because he's trying to sell his, his operas to opera houses that are not interested in them. But, but nonetheless, he, he writes that sonata... Um, when he's he's 
staying in in um, in in Gastein yeah, on Gastein, holiday, yeah. and that's a good time for him. And and we know that that he writes letters from Gastein back to his family, saying it's great here. You know, wherever I go, people know about my music. And um, and and at that moment in time, he felt a sense of acknowledgement. Yes, he did. Life. But you will agree that that it didn't last very, very much. And I think especially towards the end, you know, towards this 1827, 28, another wave of, of despair came in again to his life. But it's true to see and it's very beautiful to see that the, the Gastein period was um, really hopeful and he, and he was surprised um that some people very of course cul cultural people people maybe from the aristocracy or whatever they they knew about him um about his works especially i think about about some some of the leaders some of the smaller pieces as you as you were saying it was the Amprontus and more musical they found their way into the concert life or into into the i would say amateur concert uh, you know performance or whatever um much much quicker than some of of his larger scale works so i i find myself very very you know happy to see that this period of his life was a kind of revelation to him he wouldn't have thought you know he uh, he lived i have the feeling reading the letters and 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 seeing how much or how painfully looks at, at the works of Beethoven you know he, there are so many examples of, of how how he knew this Beethoven works intimately well and that at the same time you see the incredible recognition that Beethoven had gained in the years in Vienna uh, both as a performer a big virtuoso and improviser and also as a composer and to see that for at least for a moment of his life he comes out of the shadow of Beethoven I think is very very beautiful for you, what's in a what's in a name? What's in the title of this these impromptus? Um, I know that it's it's a name that was initially chosen by by Schubert's publisher yeah. rather than Schubert himself. But but then he 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 adopted it for of his own choice for the second set of impromptus. So it must have meant something to him. This word impromptu. What what does it mean to you? Well, it, I think it means um, a form. Um, in, in music which is maybe less severe than the sonata, something which, as the words in French say, is improvises more. And yet, are they, are they really improvisatory pieces? Well, I think on, on the point of view, for instance, of the, um, of the form, um, I would say some of them do, like the, the first of them, um, the, the first of the first setting um, has elements which you know what in in, in in the middle part of of it you 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 don't know anymore where you are I mean it it it, it wanders around and it, you don't you don't really know what he's doing even in the variations which actually in, in, which is number three of the second set which are uh, formally somehow very strict but he still wanders around and he makes every repetition a little bit different um, or aspects like the second impromptu of the first set which uh, I think it remains until now one of the only examples um, of a big major piece which ends in minor you know this kind of twisting element I think they could be seen um, in in this optic at the same time as you say uh, for instance the second set of impromptu you, you could actually see it as a whole as a sonata form you know with this big f minor um first movement and then the last uh, f minor movement which could be um like in the C minor sonata, they could be used as a sonata as a whole. So I would say there are aspects which are controversial in this. You feel the improvisatory gesture in, in this uh, in this sense, as I was telling you before, but the same at the same time, you cannot compare them with the Amprontius of Chopin, for instance, or the Amprontius that Liszt and Cole, Liebes, Troime, or whatever it is. It has, I think, both elements in it. I... I put it to you that that these impromptus illustrate if nothing else the disconnect that there can be between 
the work of a composer and the life of the composer because they're they're written in 1827 and they, they are relatively light pieces um, and and he's working on them at a time and in a place Graz where he's 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 actually spending time with his friends um, apart from the fact that he's frustrated about not getting anywhere with the operas, th th this again, it, it's, he's ha actually having a nice time with these friends in Graz. And yet, at the same time that he's doing all this, he's working on the last 12 of the songs in Winterizer, which couldn't be darker than... Yeah, I would generally pay attention to draw parallels between uh, the life of a composer and his production at the time. One one of the, I think, most striking examples is Beethoven's Second Symphony, wrote at a time where I think he's, he's thinking about committing suicide, is writing the Heiligenstädter Testament, and yet I think it's his most jolly piece. Mm -hmm. And there are other instances as well. So I think it's very, very difficult to, to, to have a parallel between what a composer is doing in his production and how he feels um, in, 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 in this period of life. Certainly, if you could do it in Schubert, I think this would be with the last three sonatas, which for me undoubtedly speak about death in three different ways, but they do. So I think probably by September 28, which was the time he wrote these three last pieces, probably a complete despair and uh, maybe point of no return in his health had been reached and he knew about this. And I think all of this, all of his production of, of, of the last two, three months is dedicated to this. This, I, say, I would say, is very clear, at least to me. I can only talk about my response to music, you know, but um, how the music speaks to me. But I think in other cases, as in impromptu, as, you, as you're saying, I mean, the, the winter rise is, some of it is so hopeless. And at the same time, you have a lot of hope and you have a lot of dance music in the impromptus. So I would say it's very, very, very difficult to say he felt this way, he composed this way. But you can see um, within also the impromptus or within the winterizer, the, the range of moods which are present in them. He probably could take these moods from different experiences he had in life. I mean, completely depression and hope and whatever it is. And he put all of them into music. And this, I think, remains one of the reasons why Schubert speaks so much to me and I think to you and to, to most of us. It's so personal, you know. You can feel that the range of, of situation, the experience in life can be found in, in, in most of his works. And, and they speak to us in a very personal, intimate way. And I think, at least to me, without any sense of ego, you know, it's very, very modest and pure. A large part of the experience of your life these days, beyond playing the piano, is running a music festival. Um, and you do that on your own home territory in Ascona, which is next door to Locarno. Um, and you've been doing that since 2013 or something Yes, like I that? started working a little bit before. The, uh, the 13 was my, my first edition, but I started working at the end of 11. Look, it was a very emotional decision. Um, the Settimane Musicale, which is my festival, um, was the place where I got to know music. I was four and my parents brought me to a recital of Alicia de la Rocha playing Granados. Soon after, they brought me to the Dallas Symphony and, and, and Slatkin um, playing Tchaikovsky Number no. 5, and they discovered all the music actually there. The first Goldberg variations I still heard Franz Brüchen on, on, on the recorder, and, and then uh, I heard Kopman, and I heard modern music, I heard... So you can imagine what such a setting means to you. I mean, I thank... And this, this festival in Ascona, it's it's an old established festival, Yeah, it's, it? it's we been... are getting 75. Yeah. So, the, you know, it has a big history, and, and many of the most 
renowned musicians of last century played there, from Elisabeth Schwarzkopf to Muti and Abado and everybody. So when the city of, 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 Los, of Ascona asked me to take it over, I was completely amazed that they thought about me. But they wanted somebody who programs and at the same time is part of the program. You know, there are other festivals like this, like my friend Renaud Capuçon is doing the same in Aix-en-Provence. So. Um, uh, life of Ansnes in Norway, and, and there, there are many instances. I think it's nice because the public then um, gets to know an artist, and in this case, they they know me for a very long time because you know they, they saw me in the first footsteps and they they saw the evolution, and so I think they trust also my musical choices behind. You know, I'm not somebody who's just coming from a, a managing school and then tries to to sell. Um, and then to make the pro program as likable as possible and with likable, I mean to program the four seasons by Vivaldi every time, you know. I, I take my choices, I take my risks. And I said it right from the beginning to the city. I said, look, I, I will take my choices. They might be sometimes unpopular. I might take modern music into it. I might take artists you don't know and are not on the, on the first page of, of the Gramophone magazine, but I believe in them. And I think it has worked out very well. Great thing about running a festival is that you can you can make the music you want, yeah. and you can do it with the people you want. Yes. So you bring your friends. I bring my friends, or I bring people um, that uh, w where I would travel to to their concerts. You know, I would somebody like Elizabeth Leonskaya. Uh, I would travel hours on plane to listen to her because I love her playing and so I decided to invite her because I believe that this is among the best that we have. Stephen Kovacevic was by the way uh, at the Queen Elizabeth Hall yesterday. Uh, I believe that his Beethoven is one of his uh, one of the greatest things I've ever heard. I remember coming out from a uh, performance where he played the Diabelli variations. I was completely shaken. I couldn't sleep at night. I, so this is the thing which um, interests me. And I must say, um, I've seen more and more a tendency um, in Germany also, very alarmingly so, to go in a, in a very commercial direction. You know, a major, uh, so-called major record labels brings out a newcomer um, with a PR machine behind, which is unbelievable. I must, I must say that many of your journalist colleagues then completely, you know, they do, they seem to do the PR together with the record label instead of, you know, really writing something. They, they, they simply write what the major label tells them to write. This is my feeling. And this creates a sense of, um, you know, talking a lot about somebody for a couple of years and then for some mysterious reason this person disappears and then the journal many journalists write oh you know he didn't he didn't somehow survive the stage or whatever and then the next person comes in and this i think it's a very dangerous um, way of looking at artists and, and looking at careers because you create a kind of um event out of something you create uh, you scream a lot for a couple of years about an artist and then you forget about him and this is not what what i believe i believe in quality and i believe in in, in you know i uh, being 30 years uh, with the piano and with the music it means that i have a certain experience i have a certain way of listening or a certain way of of knowing what an artist does and I bring this experience to the festival. And I think it has paid off because, and I'm not saying this for, you know, fishing for compliments, but I've, I've got many, many letters, for instance, at the end of last year's festival, say, thank you for bringing me in this artist. I didn't know about him or about her, but I feel that there is something there which I cannot put into words, but I know that there is something incredible about this person playing. And for this, I think it's worth doing it. it. It's been a great joy to talk to you. I hope I will be there in November when you come to the Wigmore to do your Schubert. And between now and then, good luck to you in the coming season. Thank you very much and looking forward to seeing you in November.